Shalom. We would like to start. My name is uh, Dan Vilensky. Uh, I'm coming from the industry. I'm the chairman of a company named Applied Material, which is a subsidiary of an American company operating here in, uh, in Israel. Um, I have some uh, a feeling for the academy because I spent several years in uh, Carnegie Mellon University in the, in the US. Uh, also, as a volunteer, I'm the chairman of uh, the Fulbright uh, program. And uh, I would like uh, to uh, give some uh, brief uh, information about another activity that I'm involved with, which is the Israeli National Nanotechnology uh, Initiative. It's a background for the, some of the uh, presentations. Um, uh, more than a year ago, the Israeli government uh, gathered uh, several uh, uh, academy people and industrial people uh, to investigate or to come with recommendation uh, what should we uh, do in Israel in order to uh, um, uh, to be a strong player uh, in the area of uh, nanotechnology. Um, we came up with uh, conclusions. The conclusion were that uh, um, the need is for the next five years to spend uh, $300 billion dollars um, uh, one third of that for uh, to support the uh, programs uh, in the universities, one third uh, to support the industry, which has a responsibility to pull some of the uh, mature research uh, from the academy to the to the industry, and the third one is that to build a nanotechnology prototyping center, so not every university and every startup will have to. Um, uh, to uh, build uh, the infrastructure required and will focus on uh, what they are good at, which means uh, the research. The government have accepted it, and the first uh, $30 million uh, was uh, um, uh, assigned to that uh, program. We are now at the second year. The first year, we spent uh, around uh, $6 million for many for capital equipment. This year, it will be uh, the same, and the years to follow, will be partially capital equipment, and part of that will be um, uh, for, uh, for research. On top of that, the government is supporting a $30 million five years program, which is called Magnet, which is a consortium uh, for companies that are working in the field of uh, nanotechnology. Uh, we are trying uh, in uh, all different directions. One of the uh, additional direction that was approved now by the Israeli government is that every university in Israel that will bring a donation up to a $26 million donation, and if the academy will, will agree uh, from uh, its own uh, resources to match this uh, number, um, the government of Israel will uh, match another, the same amount of money to support the program. The first program that was approved is a program uh, as a Technion. Uh, so the Technion today has $78 million for five years to support a nanotechnology. And I know that several other universities are in process now to uh, try to uh, get the same kind of, uh, uh, of uh, funds. Uh, just uh, another uh, effort that we are trying to do is uh, to convince the um, the people who are in charge of all the magbiot of the uh, getting donations from the Jewish communities around, around the world that, uh, to uh, uh, donate part of the, um, part of the donation uh, to uh, scientific, uh, infra scientific infrastructure uh, in, in Israel. I can't declare successes yet, but probably it will uh, come up. <coughs> um, so this is just the background about some of the activities uh, in, uh, that we are doing at the Israeli Nanotechnology Initiative. Unfortunately, most of our efforts in the area to try to get money and less in the strategy and direction for the, um, uh, for, uh, for the Israeli industry and academy. Um, the connection 
between uh, us and one of the more additional co uh, connection between us and this uh, conference is the fact that one of the programs that we are supporting heavily is in the area of water desalination or what, and or water purification. Um, and I think that's sufficient for the, for the background. But I would like to, uh, uh, to bring some ground rules for the discussion so that we can finish uh, on time. We have three uh, presenters. Each of them will have about 20 uh, minutes uh, for the presentation and about five to ten minutes uh, to reply to a uh, question from the, from the audience. Later, later we have several uh, additional people that will uh, join us here on the podium and um, uh, will answer a general uh, question. The target is to finish exactly at, uh, at uh, three o'clock. And I will appreciate if each of you will, or all the participants will be uh, on time. Another, in order not to lose uh, too much time, and since I think that each, each presenter or each participant can present himself much better than I can do, uh, so uh, each uh, of the presenters uh, will introduce themselves. Thank you, and Professor Roshim Thank you, Dan. Uh, I think uh, Dan uh, described about half of my talk, so I won't have so many things to say. Uh, Nevertheless, I'm uh, Rashef Tene. I'm the chair of the Nano Center at the Weizmann Institute. Actually, there are two centers, and I'll talk a little bit about those. Uh, let me, I will describe to you a non-official uh, account of what's going on in Israel in terms of nanoscience and nanotechnology uh, research and development, but that will be really non-official, and there are actually experts in this, uh, in this uh, audience which are better experts to give numbers and to say uh, to give the outlines of the philosophy of the research. But uh, let me start by saying that uh, they are, uh, first of all, to describe to you the Israeli uh, scientific landscape, uh, we have six research universities, which I will uh, describe in, in a few minutes, and about 10 research uh, colleges which contribute also to R&D, and R&D, in, in some of it is in, uh, in nanotechnologies as well. Uh, there are, of course, numerous startup companies and uh, also strong R&D activity in some industrial sectors like pharmaceutical sector and uh, other sectors. Uh, about 4% <clears throat> of the GNP of Israel is dedicated to civilian R&D, uh, which accounts to about 4 to $5 billion, uh, from which 1% or so comes from public sources uh, and the rest uh, from private sources, industry, VC, VC capital, uh, private uh, donations, etc. Uh, the most important thing, uh, thing to, to mention in this context is that the freedom of research is an overwhelming principle in the Israeli uh, academia, and uh, we are uh, thinking that this is an important asset of our research, that we are not too much constrained by the limitations or by the, the constraints of the uh, R&D prog program where you have to go through milestones, etc. Uh, I bring here a, a one graph from a report uh, done by uh, Professor David King, the chief scientist of the UK government, uh, who described uh, in Nature last year uh, the uh, scientific intensity, which is something on the, uh, as the ordinate, something that uh, is, can be defined in many ways. But he defined one way, uh, which is normal, normalizing the number of citations per, uh, per paper, and the number of, of, of uh, research papers in general. Uh, and, and, uh, and he uh, plotted it against the uh, GDP of the, of, the, of the country. And as you may see from the curve, uh, all the big uh, countries except for the UK fall on a very uh, curved line which relates the, the, the scientific intensity to the, uh, to the uh, GDP. Uh, there are a few small countries that are <clears throat> very much outside the, the range of this curve. Among them, Israel is, 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 is uh, outstanding in the sense that we have a very small GDP compared to the Western societies or Western countries, and nevertheless, we excel in terms of scientific intensity. And this is mentioned in the, in the paper of, uh, in the document of uh, David King. And uh, of course, this is not, this is only one way to express uh, how uh, science is, is, is uh, how, how good science is per uh, unit of uh, dollar or, or shekel. 
but I think it's important to mention that Israel stands out as an excellent research uh, in, 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 in uh, many aspects, and I will come to that point in, in uh, my next uh, few slides. So R&D uh, activi activities in nanoscience and nanotechnologies in Israel, as I mentioned, the R&D activities in this area is very diversified in Israel and, uh, and encompass R&D work in the universities, colleges, and the industry. Uh, there is no single body overseeing this activity. It's very diversified, and uh, as because we keep the uh, principle of freedom of, of research, uh, we everybody, every researcher in the university is allowed to do whatever he likes to do, and he's promoted according to his accomplishment in uh, basic fundamental science, and not by, by other criteria. Uh, each of the five research universities, I said yeah, formally six, but the uh, Haifa University is not exactly a research university in Israel, and we have also uh, the Open University, which is certainly not a, a research university in the common sense. Uh, so each of the five research universities had uh, today a nano center, Center for Nanoscale Science and Technology. Uh, the Weizmann Institute and the, the Technion have two of those. Uh, the industry is very active in R&D, and as Dan mentioned, we have the uh, consortium, the, which is part of the MAGNET program, uh, and I'll come to that in a minute. The government, uh, as, I, as Dan mentioned already, consulted the Israeli Academy of Sciences uh, to provide guidelines a few years ago to this activity, and uh, I, I, uh, I specify it in more detail. So the Israeli nanotechnology initiative that Dan mentioned uh, was uh, actually started three years ago, some, uh, and uh, uh, Telem, the body of the, of the Israel Academy of Science overseas special project, uh, formed a forum which was headed by Dan Maidan, the former president of the Israeli, of the, sorry, of Applied Materials International. And uh, Dan Maidan took upon himself to uh, build, a, to, to head this forum, and after long discussions between the body, the member bodies, and the testifying of various uh, people like me and others from the industry, uh, they came up with a report, and the report uh, was uh, is, the, is specified in red, um, and main, namely to train uh, 40 graduate students per year to issue 200 patents, to have five viable startup companies, and 70, 750 employees by 2002. Five, seven, sorry. And uh, as, as Dan mentioned, the combined investment is $300 million over five years, uh, which has been, uh, and I'll come to talk about it, uh, has been modified quite a bit now by the new policy of the government. Uh, focusing on, uh, the focus is on uh, the following areas, nanomaterials, nanoelectronics, optoelectronics too, water desalination, and bio nanotechnologies. And uh, some uh, 10 to $15 million have been provided also uh, already as a support for uh, academic uh, infrastructure. Um, in the universities, we have, as I mentioned, five research universities, Technion in Haifa, Tel Aviv University in Tel Aviv, where we sit today, Barilan University in Ramat Gan, not far from here, Weizmann Institute in Rehovo, 20 kilometers south of here, 30 kilometers, Ben-Gurion University in the south, in the Negev, and Hebrew University in Jerusalem. All these universities are, uh, have a nano center which uh, encompass about 10 to 25 active research groups, uh, almost 50 students in, in each uh, center, maybe 40 to 50. Uh, the Technion and Weizmann, as I mentioned earlier, have, have two centers, and uh, there is a reason for that. It's not just, uh, a, uh, it's not just out of the will of somebody. <clears throat> but I won't have time to go into that. A major contribution to this activity comes from private donations, which is somewhat erratic and unpredictable. And that has been uh, specified already by uh, Dan, uh, that uh, this year the government has changed the rules and decided to match the, the, any uh, donation by matching one-to-one, -one, and that uh, leads to, to great imbalances in R&D investments among the different universities. And one has to recognize it because the Israeli system up to now was very clean in terms of uh, peer review. Every proposal was peer reviewed. This decision makes uh, no, we, all the universities have collected the large sums of donations for R&D in the past, but now the Israeli government, uh, by, from the taxpayer money, goes and uh, invests money without any uh, uh, peer review system. And uh, we can discuss it if it's, in, if it's good or not, but that's, I'm not going to discuss it any further. Um, 
There are several agencies which provide support for R&D in Israel. The Israel Science Foundation, the German Israel uh, Foundation, the U.S. Uh, B-National Science Foundation, uh, they are all uh, totally non-restrictive uh, fashion, and the research is done in totally non-restrictive fashion. Uh, there is, uh, and it's all uh, supported by peer review system, very careful peer review system. The competition is very tough, of course, to get the, the, the grants from these agencies. <clears throat> the Ministry of Science used to have, it still have a small program, which is called Tashtiyot, and I think it's a very important program where we have consortia of groups from different uh, universities in Israel, uh, and uh, the, min the Ministry of Science, of course, uh, is through its peer system, uh, oversees this program, and I call it in the parenthesis, Israel Research Institute. I think it's important because we have the same, uh, the same language, the same culture, and same scientific, and, and uh, a lot of common equipment and, and ideas. We can discuss it among ourselves and can increase our virtual uh, laboratory. Uh, also, I have to mention the research group in Israel are usually very small. So it's very important for us to unify force, and I have a few very uh, <coughs> remarkable examples that I can say, state uh, from my own research. Uh, I'm taking now a patent on, on a medical device that was invented uh, together with uh, doctors in, in Hadassah Medical School with no support from any agency. And uh, this uh, has been done due to the, I think, largely due to the common uh, culture that people go to it to bounce to, to, to offices of, of one another and start to talk and then they start to have joint ideas and, and make products which are very promising. Uh, the chief scientist of some ministries provides also some small amounts of money for uh, research granted uh, in earmarked areas. Uh, there are two uh, ministries that have larger earmarked program, uh, the Ministry of Industry and uh, Trade and Commerce and the Ministry of Defense. Uh, I won't go to the Ministry of Defense because I don't know much of, about it, but as to, as to the Ministry of Industry and Trade and Commerce, uh, we, uh, <clears throat> we have few uh, programs. We have the uh, actually uh, we have uh, the large research consortia, the magnet program, one of which is the nanofunctional material, a consortia of nano materials that holds, uh, that in which uh, there are 14 industries and 12 research groups from the academia. And it's, it's, uh, I think the budget is between five to $10 million for <clears throat> three years. Uh, there is also the uh, smaller uh, programs, the magnet magneton, which are bilateral agreements between the, the industry and the academia, and they usually last for one year, and the budget is limited usually to below $1 million. Uh, and uh, there are um, uh, the, the Hamamot, the greenhouses, I'm not sure that I expressed the name correctly, uh, which are uh, small startup companies supported by the government with small amount of money, uh, with, with, uh, and after three years they have to stand on their own feet. Uh, so all, of, all, all, on, all in all, the Ministry of Science and Techno uh, the, of uh, Trade and, and Industry supports a large amount of the Israeli R&D, and especially those that are uh, uh, subjects that are more suitable for the industry, of course. <clears throat> this is, of course, not a free uh, research. It's a, a, a earmarked research or, or oriented research. Uh, Israel takes, as you know, a part in the uh, European program uh, research uh, FP6 and will take part also in the uh, next uh, program, the FP7. Uh, and I'm, I do not have numbers for how many Israeli companies and, and, uh, and uh, but Israel invests about $50 million per year uh, in, in, uh, in this program and some of it goes to uh, nanomaterials and nanotechnologies. And I, I know my, for myself that uh, I'm, the industry that is associated, affiliated with my own research is going to sign soon a very large uh, program, one of the, those programs. They uh, win, won a, pro, a big project uh, with 20 industries around them. Um, Hamamot I won't mention because I mentioned only that it's small companies that are organized in, in, a, in a special locations and are uh, su supposed to stand on their own feet after three years. I want to go very briefly to the Helen and Martin Kimmel Center for Nanoscale Science which is one example of how Center uh, for Nanoscience nano, nano uh, can work out. I'm the director of this center. Uh, we built it around actually three facilities, the nanofabrication facility, 
and uh, molecular biology and uh, characterization. Uh, we also, and uh, this is shown here, the idea is to have molecular biology and, uh, and, uh, and nanofabrication facility at the same, under the same roof so that people can do uh, this, this uh, things that would sound very bizarre in, initially, uh, like putting DNA on, on silicon chips, and we are doing uh, this now successfully in this center because we have the capacity to handle DNA molecules on the one, on one side and do nanofabrication on the, on the other side of the, of the center or of the facility. So this is some pictures of the facility. This is the electron beam uh, or electron microscope for nanolithography, and we have such a device, similar device or similar facility in the physics. I mentioned that at the Weizmann we have uh, two centers, one in the physics, one in the chemistry. Uh, we also built an electron microscopy laboratory, and as you see, it's a very respectable electron microscopy facility, which is very important for uh, nanomaterials. We have two high-resolution TEM FEG DEMs. Uh, we have now three high-resolution FEG SEMs, and we have three regular DEMs. It an, uh, represents an investment of six or seven or eight million dollars. I'm not sure how much. And this was all done by uh, most of it. The, the expenses were uh, uh, we obtained from the Weizmann uh, Institute. Let me go briefly to my own research. In two minutes, I'll try to show you. Uh, in 1992, one year after the discovery of carbon nanotubes, I had the idea that you can make nanotubes also from inorganic compounds which have lamellar structure. And I won't go into the details, but uh, the, the, the idea came from the, from the, from the observation that uh, when you take graphite, graphite is made like a deck of cards of, of graphene atoms. They are arranged like a deck of cards. Now, when you make it very small, it's shown on the left side here, uh, the graphite becomes unstable and folds on itself and forms nanotubes and fullerene-like structures. If you take a page and fold it on itself, it's exactly the same kind of phenomena that occurs in, in, in graphite when you make it very small. And there is an in inherent instability uh, for graphite when it becomes very small. There are many, many dangling bones at the F, uh, on the edges, on the rim of this, of this graphene plan, on this uh, card, that they become uh, unstable and fold on themselves and form nanotubes or fullerenes. Uh, once I, this idea was around, I decided that this could be also occur in, in inorganic materials with the same structure. And there are thousands of compounds with inorganic compounds with a lamellar structure, which are made like a deck of card. And if you make it very small, they will spontaneously form themselves fullerene-like structures and nanotubes, and you see here a picture of a fullerene-like structure of tungsten disulfide. It's a beautiful spherical structure. It's a high-resolution TEM picture. Each pixel in the center is actually one atom or, a play or, or array of atoms, one behind the, the other. So it's a, it's a, it's a lovely picture of, of a spherical hollow ball made of 13 or 14 layers of tungsten disulfide. This material by itself now uh, is in demand. Uh, we have already orders the company that uh, licensed the technology for more than 2,000 uh, tons per year of this product. And the reason is that it, it is an extremely good lubricant, one. Second, we have a very good synthetic process which can allow us to synthesize one kilogram of this material per day. It's very cheap and it also has no cell, uh, health hazards. So, uh, all in all, uh, this represents a very important uh, addition of nanotechnology or nanomaterials to uh, the, the technology lands landscape or nanotechnology landscape. We recently found uh, there is almost no car company, aerospace company, microelectronics, cell phone companies, uh, food uh, and pharmaceutical that do not, uh, or many of them, that approach uh, us and, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, want to make a collaborate, collaborative programs and uh, uh, there are larger names that, large names that have been mentioned already, like Volkswagen and Hatco and others. Um, uh, we uh, recently uh, found out also that it's a very stable material uh, under a constraint, under compression, and uh, also very strong under tensile. And so we think now that this material, and when I say when we think, the industry thinks, because the industry comes and asks us to provide the material for high-strength nanocomposites, and um, for uh, high strength uh, glues or, or uh, various other composites uh, for, with ex exceedingly good mechanical properties. 
and we have good reasons to believe that it will work uh, in, in, in nanocomposite to, to become a very good nanocomposite, very strong, very tough nanocomposite in the future. Uh, the nanotubes that you see here, it's a beautiful nanotubes of, uh, or again, of tanks and disulfide. We uh, are able to produce this in a few grams per day, still not a, in a pure form. It has a, a exceedingly good mechanical properties. It's like, actually, what you see here is a TM picture of such nanotube uh, with very, uh, very punctuated. Uh, each pixel is actually an atom or an area of atom, and, and, uh, and they are all very perfect, highly perfect, uh, uh, crystalline material and uh, nanomaterial and so they have very interesting properties electronic optical and mechanical properties and recently they were they were uh, they were shown to have also very important catalytic effects in uh, removing sulfur from gasoline uh, so all in all it has a large number of applications potential applications and this is just the tip of the iceberg because we so far we are able to synthesize one material, tungsten disulfide or molybdenum disulfide, in large amounts, and other laboratories now investigate vanadium oxide nanotubes, titanium oxide nanotubes for solar cells, for rechargeable batteries, and for many other applications. So shortly, in shortly, I would like to summarize uh, our, uh, the, my talk. I think I brought you the landscape, the Israeli landscape, uh, scientific landscape. I discussed in short, briefly, that um, uh, the, the initiative, the various initiative in, in nanoscience and nanotechnology, and some uh, activities in the different uh, research universities, and uh, my own research in this uh, um, arena. And I thank you for your attention. Okay, I think I would, I would like to go dwell on, on political uh, issues at this meeting because this meeting has a different agenda. But uh, for one thing, I think, I, I think it's important to mention that we have Mark Welland, which is the speaker after me. Uh, he's the head of the Nanoscience Center in uh, Cambridge University. And uh, tomorrow I... No, no, but he came to Israel. And uh, he's, uh, this is shows uh, some kind of an appreciation. And uh, tomorrow we have a visitor from Oxford University. Chaim, you want to mention something? Just, just one comment, being a faculty member of Bar Ilan University, I know this is not a direction you want the discussion to go. No, no. Thus far in, in the sciences, we are not aware of any indication of reduced collaborations, of manuscripts being rejected, of any fallout from this. There is, however, a very real concern of the university leadership from the rector of the president on down is, is concerned and is looking for ways to express that concern in a constructive fashion. As you may know, there are now international petitions circulating to try to get that boycott retracted, and hopefully it will disappear before it has negative consequences. I think that we should close this at this point. Any other questions? Engineering from State University of New York at uh, Stony Brook. First, I'd like to have an advertisement. I heard that there was a report circulating by, from Britain on nanotechnology. I had with me the similar report from the National Science Foundation. I was on a committee for the National Science Foundation uh, to write on nanotechnology, the grand challenge that was published in uh, 2003. And uh, that should be outside as well.
pictures. Excuse me. Uh, I gave it to the conference organizers. I'm not sure how they're dealing with it. Either they're making copies or they're the sign of sheet. You have to see on our Okay. Um, first, I'm actually from the. Um, I, I direct a, a center in material science and engineering, which is a nano um, sponsored by the National Science Foundation. And um, you can see in Stony Brook, uh, in, in the United States, there's a set of centers, nano centers, and we are not a nano center. We're just a center for uh, polymer surfaces and interfaces. But as you'll see soon, surfaces and interfaces very quickly. Uh, tend to fall into the nano uh, region. Now, as, what you see on the bottom, I don't know if there's a pointer, is that in the United States, um, the centers, we're not only, our mandate is not only to do research, but we're also mandated for outreach to the community, which was something that was raised here uh, in the first day that education is very important. But education is not really educating the public. That takes too long. One of the most important parts in educating the public on your research is giving them a stake in what you're doing. And there's no better way of doing that than to involve students and their children, especially at the high school level. So you can see what we have on the bottom. It's almost mandatory now in the United States when you write a proposal to have a significant section on outreach. And you can see. Um, these are the participants in our center. We have an all-American crew of graduate students. <laughs> but uh, we also have a very integrated way of doing research, where these are the graduate students, but we also have undergraduates participating. And every summer, we also have a large contingent of high school students, uh, something like 50, that participate actively in the research. And it's sort of not a padded room, but they actually do their own projects in the sense that there, if there is something really risky or exploratory, we in fact have these students try it out. And um, I'm not going to show it here, but what actually happens when you talk about public relations is that when these students win prizes like Siemens, Westinghouse, or Intel, uh, they're the ones who have interviews at the White House or with congressmen and senators, and that way we get our message across as to the research that we're doing to the general public and the press. Now, uh, nanotechnology and nanoparticles. Reshef talked about the general infrastructure. I'll talk a little bit about the research that we do in our center, and also about nanoparticles that, that are in contact with us every day. And uh, one of the most common that, that people have seen over and over again is that of rubber tires. And our center collaborates a lot with industry. One of our main partners is ExxonMobil, in particular, Dennis Pfeiffer. And uh, what you see here is a physicist's view of a rubber tire. A tire contains about 15 kinds of rubber. And uh, what's important in the tire is proper adhesion between these different rubbers. And you can see here what happens when the adhesion is not there, or as is also known as a Firestone situation. But as I'll show in a minute, it's not really peculiar to Firestone. It's really endemic in all rubber tires. Um, what happens here, the way the rubber tire is made, it's one of the original nanoparticles, which is carbon black. Carbon black is about uh, 100 angstroms in diameter, roughly. And what carbon black really is, um, it's a small, very small crystal. This 100 angstrom is really composed of crystallites that are about 20 angstroms in size. And what happens is that the chains, the polymer chains, the rubber chains, are trapped at the interfaces between the different crystals. And when something is trapped, it can't move. Now, how do you analyze the inside of a rubber tire? How do we get to look inside and make sure the tire hangs together? The only way to do that is through neutron scattering. Neutrons are a benign beam. They don't scatter by Coulomb interactions. They're very penetrating. And this is a small rig that we've set up where we actually take slices of, of the rubber and the rubber tire. This is a brominated isomethyl styrene, also known as X-Pro. It's an exon polymer. This is a very special polymer because it's what's inside your tire 
It's a polymer that keeps the air in. Your tire stays inflated for a very long time. And we make it an interface with deuterated polybutadiene, which is basically tire rubber. And we, neutrons come in and then scatter out. And you get spectra that sort of look like this. This is the critical angle, just like you look at your reflection on water. And if you're a very shallow angle, everything gets reflected. As you move your eye towards a more deeper and deeper angle, you start to get these oscillations, which tell you about the thickness of that film and the interface. When these oscillations disappear, the two layers have diffused into each other. This is the uh, two rubbers, and they're very miscible. They diffuse very readily into each other over distances of about 1,000 angstroms or hundreds of nanometers. These are many polymer chains, and they make a very tight bond. But what happens when you start to introduce even as little as half a percent of carbon black, they trap the chains and they prevent them from moving. So now, instead of a few thousand angstroms, your interface is now 40 angstroms or 4 nanometers. This is less than a polymer chain. In other words, your typical rubber tire that you arrived here on has an interface that you're, that's really no broader than half a polymer chain, which means that if it wasn't for the van der Waals intermolecular interaction, the tire wouldn't hold together at all. Hence the problem with SUVs and turning. Now, this is not a good situation. The question is, what can be done about it now that we know? And, uh, there are many ways. Well, if we know that it has to do with the surface interaction, then instead of using carbon black, carbon black is there to make the tires stronger, one can also use colloidal silica. Colloidal silica are silica nanoparticles covered by a polymer, which makes it less attractive so that it's almost inert and non-interactive with the matrix. Colloidal silica is white, and in fact, Michelin, what's known as a high-performance tire, is colloidal silica. And these interfaces are very broad. We could have predicted that. These interfaces are broad, and they have very good adhesion. But there's a problem with this, is as you'll know, if you go to the uh, fair about the aircraft fair in Paris, they can't use high-performance tires on airplanes because the landing gear is responsible for discharging the aircraft when it lands. So what can we do? The problem is now faced to re-engineer the nanoparticle and to increase the adhesion. But if you know the physics behind it, and this was a collaboration with the Sid Richardson Company, the world's largest manufacturer of carbon black, if you know that these are chains trapped at the interfaces of crystals, if you take these carbon particles and you heat them to 2,400 degrees centigrade very slowly, they crystallize. And then the entire particle, all 100 angstroms of it, becomes a single crystal of graphite. You can see these are Bragg peaks that tell you that it's a good crystal. When that happens, the interface is restored, and the adhesion uh, between the rubbers is restored. And hence, one can solve at a molecular level the Firestone problem instead of a macroscopic level, which is what they do right now. They tie it together with this very large band of plastic. Other areas in the automotive industry are nanotubes, which is very similar to what Reshev showed before. But why nanotubes? Again, if you see your car, your car has many layers of paint. The first one is the primer. It has to be conductive because it's put on by electroplating. Now, one way to make it conductive is to add carbon, as we said before. But your typical rubber tire has about 20% carbon, which makes it very brittle. Because these are particles, again, that's not very pure. This is very coarse, industrial-grade material. And you have to add a lot of it if you're going to rely on this for the conductivity. On the other hand, the nanotubes, even though they're multi-walled, are very long. They're microns in length, even though they're nanometers in size. And you can get away with less than 1% and still have a conductive painting. Now, uh, one of the speakers last night um, discussed that these carbon nanotubes and all these things are basically designed to be miscible in polyolefins and non-water soluble materials. But the way the industry is going is towards uh, water soluble paints simply because of the disposal problem of polyolefin materials and also the fact that they're carcinogenic. So uh, organic wastes, 
uh, reduction of organic waste and, and using water soluble materials uh, is gaining popularity. Uh, another very common nanoparticle, which is used a lot in industry and also in our center, are these organic clays, um, these inorganic clays. And these clays are natural. They're your typical clay that you make pottery from. It's mined from the ground. What they basically are are silicon, magnesium, and aluminum layers. And in between, uh, they've got sodium ions just sold from the ground. The ions, the ionic forces, hold these clays together very tightly, except when they're dissolved in water. Then they exfoliate into thousands and thousands of, of platelets. Each platelet about two nanometers on the side and, and uh, about 100 nanometers square and, and about tw uh, anywhere between uh, 10 and 20 angstroms thick. Now, these are held together by ionic forces. In order to use this material uh, in a polymer, one has to exfoliate it. And in order to do that, these clays are usually functionalized with ditalo groups, which are basically CH groups that are attached to the surfaces. And then mechanically, or adding a, a polymer inside, you exfoliate them. Why is exfoliation so good? Uh, you can see uh, here, OK, we'll go forward and then backwards. This is an exfoliated, uh, this is a polymer that was mechanically mixed. And this is known as a braid bender. This is very old. This instrument is about 30 years old, but the technology has not changed very much. And once it's been functionalized, the planes just slip on their side, and you get a only about 10% clay by weight uh, will give you a huge amount of these platelets inside the material. They're very easily oriented. And they give the material very unique properties, improved mechanical properties. The modulus can go up by orders of magnitude. Thermal properties. One, a very important one is low gas permeability. And as I'll show in a little bit, flame retardant. And also, they make them very easy to blend with other polymers and with recycled materials. Um, and the UV characteristics now becomes very similar to that of glass, even though it's a polymer, and now it becomes moldable. So one thing where they use very, very commonly right now is, again, in the automotive industry. And the paints on cars typically contain clay. This is an atomic force microscope picture. You see the clays here inside this paint. And what happens, this is a glass bead, which is another component inside the paint. And the glass bead is an analog for a dust particle. If without the clay, this is your typical car paint, it wets the glass bead that has this meniscus, and it gets very dirty. It attracts dust and particulates from the air. When it has these nanoparticles in it, it doesn't attract them. You can see now there's no meniscus. And the coat and the paint remains shiny with a high brilliance. Um, what else happens? Because the clay, the exfoliated clay, is smaller than the wavelengths of light, this is now a polymer with clay in it. And it's completely clear, even down to 15 weight percent. So now you can take the windshield. The windshield shatters, get through a snowball at it. It's also difficult to mold. But these polymers are very simple to mold. You can make a windshield that's tough, that's strong, that can be placed glass see-through. But there's a problem. The compound is optically clear, moldable, shatterproof. But is it still uh, glass doesn't burn? Does, do polymers burn? And uh, again, this is just a review. But polymers are increasingly substituting, for example, which one of these is wood? metal, fibers, glass. Everything is now going towards polymers. But we cannot forget that polymers are carbon and hydrogen. And when you heat them, they make volatile gases. And most fires that occur, uh, the walls are burning. But really what's happening, most injuries occur from the smoke and the decomposition of the polymeric material. And in fact, acrylics, which is what's used in paint and in, the, in a lot of automotive products, uh, this is from the material safety sheet. They form explosive clouds on decomposition, toxic and irritant and flammable vapors. So what can we do about that? 
And again, this was a project from our lab and many others, including Menachem Levine from uh, the Casali Institute. And what you do is you combine clay, you combine decabrome and now phosphorus in small quantities if clay is used. Clay helps disperse the decabrome material. This is without clay, it's not dispersed. And what the clay does, it, in, it encloses, you see here it's exfoliated, it encloses the polymer and the bromine. So when the material begins to burn, polymer vapor comes out, it gets uh, completely extinguished by combining with the bromine vector, uh, vapors in a gas phase reaction. And you can put a torch to these polymers. Here, this is one of the high school students. He's burning, he's doing what's known as a ULV0 underwriter's laboratory test, where you hang the polymer by a clip, you put a torch to it for 10 seconds, five times in a row, take the torch away, and it's almost like the burning bush, it's burning, there's a flame, but the material is not consumed, it doesn't burn. And this is what happens to elvisite without any clay in it. it, it really it flashes very quickly, and there was a very famous fire in, in a Rhode Island discotheque some years ago, where what caught fire were actually the walls. And this is the same thing if you just have bromine in it, because the vapor pressures don't match. And this is what happens when you add a little bit of the nanoclay that confines the vapors. This is after this, this piece had been burned repeatedly, and now it's passed, it has the UL uh, safety approval, which is what's going to be needed from, for polymers by the year 2008 for any kind of polymer that's used in construction or in any kind of electronic application to prevent burning. Uh, this is just a, the car of the future. I had been invited to go to a conference on TPOs to, uh, that where cars are going. And the vision of the car of the future, this is just the front end of it with tires and bumper and everything else. But because you can make anything out of a polymer now, you can make a windshield, you can make a piece that's strong as steel, you can make it conducting. Where the industry is going is to mold the entire car out of one piece where you have the bumper, the headlights, the windshield, everything is built in and made out of functionally graded polymers, which are nanocomposites. But of course, you've got the open issues here of safety, adhesion, appearance, and other issues. This comes from the DuPont website and from this conference. Uh, other common applications where you'll see nanoparticles. Uh, remember we said that uh, permeability to gases a very important industry is bottles because this uses a lot of gas and transportation of, of food materials. And you see Coca-Cola now comes in plastic, but if you look at beer and wine, it's still coming in glass. And the Coke bottles have an expiration date. Coke doesn't expire, it doesn't go bad, it's not a fruit. What the expiration date is about is diffusion of the carbon dioxide outside of the plastic. But if you look at the patent literature, uh, exfoliated clays are being used more and more now to produce plastics that are impermeable to gases. And you'll be seeing more and more bottles now under high compression with CO2 that contain nanocomposites in food material. Um, these are again were two of our students and uh, they, uh, they worked with a grant from NASA on nanocomposites for lithography and for de wetting. And you can see here that on Earth, uh, if you have a lubricant, this is a lubricant, you're going to smear it onto a surface, and it wets the surface automatically. Most materials de-wet because of unfavorable energies. But any layer that's greater than a micron on Earth is flattened by gravity and forced to stay as a lubricant. Anybody familiar with the space program knows about all kinds of failures of doors left open, and it's usually a lubricant failure because in the absence of the stabilizing force of gravity, this is what happens to most oils on the space shuttle. They de-wet. And when they de-wet, they're no longer a lubricant and they'll seize. The question is, what can one do and what can one add nanoparticles to force wetting on a material? And the answer is yes. Again, through nanoengineering with clays, the clays, in the other picture I forgot to mention, they're the size of the polymer chain, and they can actually grab and interact with the polymer chain. And this is the lubricant silicone oil where clay was added. 
versus silicon oil where clay was not added. And you can see that clay stabilizes the material now completely against the wetting, which is a process that would be independent of gravity. And in the case of uh, lithography, there's a limit to how small a feature we can make. And that limit is basically by the polymer mask. If you start to make the feature on the size of a single polymer chain, it no longer stays rigid and it melts, so you lose your resolution. Here, too, uh, nanoparticles come to help. And this is a little bit fancier than I did because the high school students made these transparencies. This is a mask. We do it on contact printing into the polymer. And we did it with and without nanoparticles inside the polymer. And you can see there's a huge difference in the, oof, I can get it. Um, never mind. There's a big difference in the quality of the mask with a nanoparticle. We can get, oh, it flashed on. It, with an, when the nanoparticles are there, you get very sharp needles, which is what you need for a mask for, for displays and anywhere where you're looking at electrical discharges. Whereas without the nanoparticle, the material becomes soft and melts way before its normal melting transition. Okay, before we, I'll, I'll rush. And now finally, one of the other applications, we have electronics. These are singular molecular electronics that we work with with Costa Liquor at Stony Brook. And here you have nanoparticles between electrodes where this is now becomes a transistor gate uh, with, uh, with a 200 angstrom gap. And uh, one of our biggest supporters uh, really is Estee Lauder because with cosmetics. And this is just an ad for somebody, something called Bees Natural Products. And they tell you everything is wonderful and natural in this cosmetic. But then the next step, you say, what's in it? All kinds of nanoparticles, iron, titanium, zinc. Uh, you can make almost any color uh, by the combination of these in nanoparticles. Now, what happens? This is an SEM image of titanium dioxide nanoparticles. And I'll skip. And these are iron oxide made by Avi Ullman, used in medical applications. So now, this comes from the report of the National Science Foundation. And as I've summarized, in the past decade, they said, extraordinary progress has been made in the field of nanoparticle substances. We've been able to go into biomedicine, magnetic data storage, electronics, self-cleaning coatings, fabrics. A lot of wonderful things have been made and have been commercialized. The problem is, in order for this to become industrially profitable, uh, as Resha said, we must now be able to make large quantities of these nanoparticles. And when you start to make large quantities of nanoparticles, this is where the issues of what does it do biologically becomes relevant. So, um, and you start to see this now came from the latest internet, friend or foe. We use it, we have it every day, we're familiar with it, but people are beginning to worry. And it's very important that we have scientific answers when you see things like this. Now, there are two different ways of attacking the, science, uh, the scientific aspect of it. One of them is that the organism as a whole, does it cause cancer or not? I'm not a clinician. But as an engineer and a scientist and a physicist, we approach it at the cellular level and try to understand the effect of nanoparticles at the building blocks of biology and how cells react to them. So what we did was the, we took dermal fibroblasts because the skin is your first area of contact. And we cultured them with gold citrate. Gold, again, from the MSDS is FDA approved. Citrate is basically vitamin C. And we just cultured cells together with these nanoparticles to see what would happen and if the cell is sensitive to a nanoparticle. And what you find, even before you go into very great analysis, that's the control. This is only a few micrograms of nanoparticles. The cells look different. The cell area, with time, starts to decrease. The cells are elongated. And here you see the nanoparticles are inside the cell to a very large degree. Um, when the cells split, the nanoparticles go over into the daughter cell, and after a while, they stop reproducing. Um, this is a cell growth curve. 
that's the control with nanoparticles. After a while, they stop growing. And the question is, where are the nanoparticles? And for this, you have to use, obviously, transmission electron microscopy because you can't see them. This is your control. Here's a nanoparticle trying to make its way into the cell. They enter very quickly, within hours. After six days, all the nanoparticles in solution are now concentrated inside the cell. And they're not leaving. Here are more cases. This is in. It does not come in by endocytosis. They just go in. The cell has natural pores along its membrane. The natural fluctuations, the thermal fluctuations of cilia along the cell membrane have an amplitude, which is the size of the nanoparticle. You've got, your body protects you against different antigens of crossing the cell membrane. Cells can recognize ions through uh, enzymes, but they cannot recognize nanoparticles that are smaller than the thermal fluctuations of the membrane. These are the mechanisms of the cell uh, through diffusion, facilitated diffusion, active transport. But these things have a Brownian motion, and the wavelength of the Brownian motion is, is larger than the nanoparticle. When that happens, there's free flow of nanoparticles across the membrane, and there's not much there to get them out. Where do they go once they're in the cell? This is the fibroblast. Here we stained for the lysosomes. Here are the nanoparticles. The nanoparticles are in the lysosomes. The cells start to create tons of lysosomes. What does that do to the cell? Uh, we use the confocal microscope. Here's the cell. These are the integrin receptors that adhere to the surface. We took different slices. That's the control. These are actin fibrils. Actin fibrils are part of the cytoskeleton in a normal cell. In cells, even with very little bit of nanoparticles, you see the actin fibrils on the bottom, but towards the top of the cell, it looks almost like a bungee cord, like the actin fibrils have, have, have snapped. Now, the actin is obviously involved. These are the uh, actin fiber density. It drops dramatically after the first layer with nanoparticle concentration. That's what it is in the absence of nanoparticles. Uh, this is broken actin. And uh, the actin fibrils, or we hold the cell together, allow it to reproduce and to move. In the case, and to stick, uh, these are broken fibrils. Those are the dots. That's the normal one. The cells cannot adhere. It cannot have its normal cell function when that occurs. Um, if we look even more closely, this is the actin of a cell with nanoparticles. There are nanoparticles incorporated in the protein. And if you know a little bit, when I just know a little bit about biology, this is the cell membrane. Uh, this is a, a receptor. These are the actin fibrils. The actin is connected to the receptor. If you sever this connection, the receptor is also lost, and the cell can no longer adhere to the surface and have its normal function in the tissue. Um, this is a normal cell again. You can see the actin structure when it's sitting on its extracellular matrix. And, uh, we were talking about titanium dioxide before. This is the common compound in suntan lotion and most makeups. And you can see the same thing happens there as well. Um, after a while, the cells do not grow. That's a, cell gro a normal cell growth curve. That's when titanium dioxide is added. If we look at the pictures, these are cells uh, with just a little bit of titanium dioxide. And the cells are almost destroyed as you add more and more nanoparticles to it. Uh, okay, I'm almost done. That's the extracellular matrix. This is the extracellular matrix with nanoparticles. It's also destroyed. It's not normal, telling you that the cells have been triggered to produce abnormal proteins. And finally, uh, when you talk about what happens when you have lysosomes, where is that important? These are phagocytes that are important in your immune system. Phagocytes that come in contact with bacteria. A normal phagocyte will ingest about 10 bacteria from our sample. In the presence of nanoparticles, we only saw about one. And overall, we found that phagocytes exposed to nanoparticles were 40% less efficient at uh, bacteria, at eating up bacteria than uh, without nanoparticles. So in conclusion, uh, 
our cells were really not designed for things fewer than a few tens of nanometers in diameter. And there's a legitimate cause of study, I would say, and maybe concern uh, in trying to understand exactly how nanoparticles work and interact with biology. Thank you. None. This is gold. None. Not at all. Yep. Well, it depends on the quantity. I don't know how much of it goes through your skin, but yes, your skin has fairly large pores. So it's quite, one of the nanoparticles, are, gold nanoparticles, are in fact used for one of these injectable vaccines. I, I'm not a physician, so I can't say, I don't know what happens to a complex organism or whether your body can fight it off. But our results show, the cells can't, yes, there is legitimate cause for concern with nanoparticles. When we did, um, we are funded by cosmetic companies in the United States. And when uh, we gave them this presentation or something similar, because a lot of materials come from them, they in fact closed their nanoparticle research laboratory. Now they're going to macro sized particles. Yeah. Yes. Right. Again, I'm not a physician, so I don't know what happens in a macroscopic organism. The TiO2 that's in many of the cosmetics uh, is agglomerated. The individual particles are very small, but unless they're uh, functionalized properly, they're large. What I didn't show you because of lack of time, um, the industry where the high tech part of it comes in, they're actually, the industry is getting better than it wants. The high tech in titanium dioxide is functionalizing it so you can get a dispersion on the nanoscale. The particles that I showed are actually microns in size because of interactions between the TIO particles. So what's used in your standard suntan lotion is probably agglomerated particles. But what was worrisome was this report by an Australian company where they are now perfecting the surfactant so they can actually get a nano-sized dispersion. Now, I don't know what these papers on the, on the macroorganisms were done, which kind of nanoparticles. No, but where they functionalized. We are not doing toxicology. There are several layers to that. But
First of all, thank you very much for um, this opportunity to come and talk today. What I'm actually going to talk about is this um, Royal Society report, which I'll come on to shortly, which was commissioned by the UK government. But before I start talking about that, I should just say a little bit about, about me um, and why I'm a scientist is, is talking about a, a government report on societal and ethical issues. Um, I'm actually director of this uh, new building in Cambridge, at the University of Cambridge, the Nanoscience Centre. And so my vast majority of my work is, is nanoscience research and has been for 20 years since I was at uh, IBM in, in the USA, IBM Research. And uh, this facility is, there's about 200 people now working here. And it's one of these interdisciplinary facilities, as, as was mentioned uh, by Reshef earlier on where we have a mixture of biologists, chemists, physicists, engineers, and so on, on a, on a whole range of projects, which I'm not going to talk about. There is, however, uh, one project, which is one of my own, which links into um, the sort of the, the wider issues and also makes a rather facile link to GM, which uh, people always say, is, what's, is the concerns about GM and, and nano, are they similar? And um, this is the only um, light-hearted similarity that I'll show you. These are flowers which uh, we grow in the lab, but they're not flowers in any um, biological sense. There, there would be an over a million of these flowers on one pinhead, and they're actually made from uh, weaving tiny filaments, nanofilaments, of a single crystal of silicon carbide. Uh, into making these, this is a bunch of flowers, into this flower-like structure. So this is the only um, uh, link between GM, the product of GM, and, and the product of nano. Now, one of the other things that we've done in, in Cambridge, which is uh, unique, is that in our science lab, we also have, uh, we appointed a social scientist, a postdoc with a social scientist. And I did this for a number of reasons, but the simplest reason was that at the time there was lots of uh, interest in, in grey goo um, and Prince Charles brought that up and we felt, in the la we felt that we weren't intellectually very well equipped to deal with these issues to understand where grey goo came from in, in respect of say an NGO's concern or public concern, so we, we had a series of workshops, and I don't know why this computer's doing this, but um, 
a series of workshops which uh, are simply there to educate our scientists about broader issues, social issues, and so on. And it's been very popular. You can see it's been on the BBC News, uh, the, the social scientist Robert Doubleday, and it's been in the, the, the Times Higher Education Supplement. So we had some background of thinking rather seriously about broader issues to do with where our science and technology was going. And so um, with that um, relationship, the, the, the issue of uh, wider issues to do with nanoscience and nanotechnology um, was already there, and the government was acutely aware of what was going on in, in the press, in the, in, in the media, with NGOs. And the final straw for the government was that Prince Charles wrote an article in the Sunday Mail and saying that he thought um, that nanotechnology could, for example, uh, he was very concerned about grey goo, about the fact that it would turn the planet into a grey morass. And he was also concerned that there were unforeseen consequences like thalidomide. And so this final act precipitated the government to sponsor a serious study into nanoscience and nanotechnology. And the way they did that was to ask the Royal Society and the Royal Academy of Engineering, who are the two preeminent science and technology societies in the UK, to do a joint study. The government provided the money. The deal, or the, 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 the requirement back to the government, or the stipulation back to the government, was that the government had absolutely no say or part in the process. So it was entirely up to us how we did it, but we were given a number of remits. And these are these four points here. So these were, these were the questions, if you like, posed by the government, but we were allowed complete free hand to decide um, how to go about doing this and what form the report finally took. The government got the report 48 hours before it was finally published. So we had to define the difference, determine, discriminate between nanoscience and nanotechnology, and just summarize them. Identify specific applications, both in the present and in the future, and if possible, identify a time frame. Assess potential health, safety, and environmental impacts of the applications, and ethical and social issues surrounding the technology, and that's, of course, a very important one for the government. And finally, identify areas where additional regulation needed to be considered. So in terms of the government, why was the government um, asking these particular questions? Uh, really because they were concerned that were they investing enough money in nanotechnology and were they investing it in the right areas? And were they exposing themselves to further uh, concern if they invested in a technology that may have some serious downstream risks. So this was a comfort factor for the government. The output of this report was a, hopefully a comfort factor that would help them make decisions, strategic decisions, both at the research and the commercial level in the future. <clears throat> I said we had a completely free hand, and the first thing we did was rather than, typically a Royal Society report has just a group of scientists who write the report. And we actually set up a working group which consisted of nanotechnologists, both academics and industrialists, but also on, on a balanced basis, um, people from the health, environmental, bioethics, consumer affairs, and people who are experts on public engagement and perception of risk. So there was a, a quite a different, a, a, quite a departure from a normal study that the Royal Society might do, say on, on GM, in that we have this much broader range. And this was a, a huge challenge because a lot of the people on this committee had heard of the term nanotechnology but didn't really understand, understand it or its consequences. So there was a lot of education that had to go through. So that's the, the working group. And the evidence was we spent a long period of time, very intensive period of time, taking evidence from outside the UK as well as from within the UK, we have Mike Rocco from the 
who's the director of the NNI program in the US, over, over to London to give evidence. We had Eric Drexler giving evidence, who um, invented the Grey Goo scenario. We had a whole series of uh, international figures giving evidence, as well as, as I say, UK. So and the submissions were written. We had workshops. We had oral evidence, in other words, telephone uh, conferences with specific people or specific groups. We commissioned a survey of public attitudes. We put all the evidence as it came out on a website, which the public could comment on or feedback uh, information on to us. <clears throat> and finally, we, we wrote this report, which was published in July 2004. So this is the actual members of the working group. These uh, industrialists or scientists on this side. On this side, we have social scientists, um, medical doctors, and so on from the, the wider um, the wider, wider, wider field. The chairman, Anne Dowling, knew nothing about nanotechnology. She's actually an aeronautical engineer. Her expertise is in um, thermodynamics of how a jet engine works. So she, she was there to um, referee, if you like, the process and to make it clear that there was no, um, we didn't start off with any predisposition as to what the, the outcome might or might not be. So let me just, uh, the report is, you can sign up for at the back, it's on the web. It's a lengthy report with a lot of appendices with all the evidence, but um, let me just go briefly through the findings, that the important findings of the report, and then finally uh, give you an indication of what the government's response has been. So we did differentiate between nanoscience and nanotechnology. Uh, these are essentially common definitions that nearly any group would come up with. But just, just differentiating between the study of, uh, as opposed to the design, characterization, and production of an application of. So in other words, going from really a research activity with no um, requirement or um, interest in commercial application to a technology-driven activity, which is clearly commercial. We also realized very quickly, um, as others have done, is that nanotechnology as a singular, is, doesn't really make much sense. There is no such thing as nanotechnology. So we, we just referred this, we referred subsequently as to, to nanotechnologies, nanotechnologies, because there's a whole series of different technologies that um, can be called nano. <coughs> Applications, well, I, I don't want to waste time on these. You've heard all about them really to, today, but... Um, in the future, as we mentioned, water purification. There was a nice poster in the back here uh, about that. Uh, drug delivery and implants. And I'll just say something interesting about um, implants. One of the groups of evidence that we collected was from a disability rights groups. And um, this is my personal uh, view. I was very surprised in talking to the disability rights that there was a lot of uh, anti-feeling about cochlear and retinal implants. In other words, a sense that um, if these became available, there may then, uh, what would follow that would be a pressure on people who are disadvantaged to have some bodily implant to make them uh, normal or to, uh, to increase their ability to see or hear. Uh, strong, strongly against such ideas, or at least for that very careful consideration of the, the consequences. So let me just go to the sort of impacts in the different arenas. Health and environment, um, we decided that most nanotechnologies pose no new risks. And it's important to, this word new, we constantly, every time we took evidence, every time we had a discussion, we kept on asking ourselves, is this something which is unique to nanotechnology or is this just a technology issue? And on many occasions you find that it's actually a technology issue that you're dealing with or a generic issue, and the nano prefix just, just refers to a specific embodiment of that. So most nanotechnologies, in, in the strictest sense, we found no obvious new risks. However, as has been mentioned uh, in, the, in the last talk, we stressed our concern about the potential impacts of manufactured nanoparticles and nanotubes 
that are free rather than fixed within a material. Have, since that's been discussed uh, in the last talk, I won't say much more about that till a little bit later on. And we also pointed out that this is done in a terminology which is useful for regulation, but chemicals in nanoparticles form have, a different, have different properties from the same chemicals at larger size. The point being here that um, size and shape on the nanoscale are not divorced from physical property. So if you change the shape and the size of an object, you can actually change its physical property. And so, um, for example, on the TiO2 particles that we just talked about, you cannot infer toxicity in one length scale or one size uh, from that of another, to that of another size. So you can't infer toxicity by just looking at one set of particles without taking into account the fact that it's possible that the properties may change with size. So a 150 nanometer TiO2 particle actually behaves differently to a 5 nanometer particle. And it would be a mistake to assume that 150 nanometer tox toxicity was the same as 5 nanometer toxicity. So we recommended um, a program of research to fill knowledge gaps, just like the program of research we just heard about. And that, that in the interim, we should, there, there should be... A, the government should look at restricting exposure of humans and the environment to free nanoparticles and nanotubes. And these are manufactured, not the ones that you get anywhere in the environment, until they are better understood. Societal and ethical, um, in the short term, not unique, again, to, to nanotechnology. But in the longer term, we did see some impacts on privacy and human enhancement, which would be specifically attainable only through a nanotechnology uh, research program. So some genuine issues then, if you want to look at those, you'll, you'll have to look into the report. So we recommended um, that for the societal and ethical arena, research into public attitudes to nanotechnology and social, social and ethical issues arising from it that there should be an active government program into looking into public attitudes and, in the second point, in making sure that there is a public dialogue. And that is going on to some extent. And the ethical and social implications of advanced technologies, this is sort of looking out into the future, as I say, from where nanotechnology is today, we felt that this... this these issues should be part of the formal training of all research. In other words, um, if you're doing a science degree or an engineering degree, you could at least attend one lecture that looked into this. Now, this may, may be in Israel, you do this anyway. Um, I was looking back at the history of the University of Cambridge. Until about 1950, if you did read Natural Sciences, as it was called, at, at Cambridge, you actually did quite a significant number of lectures on just these issues. And that dropped out completely from the curriculum and has done so for the past 50 years and is now starting to creep back in again. So this is not actually something particularly new, um, certainly for Cambridge. And this has been picked up now by a number of universities, certainly in the UK and also within Europe, where there will now start to be some formal training, some formal uh, lectures or workshops to give a, a greater understanding to scientists and engineers of what ethical and social uh, implications may be and just to give perhaps even the root, most rudimentary intellectual tools to be able to understand where they arise. Regulation, um, we decided that no new regulatory, bo regulatory bodies were needed. This is simply because I, I guess that Nanotechnology is not a technology in its own right. However, all regulators should review existing regulations, especially in respect of the, the particle size issue. So we recommended that chemicals in the form of nanoparticles or nanotubes be treated as new substances in chemical regulations and, and labeling. And that means that they have to be treated as though they've been it's a completely new chemical and, held, and, and hence have much stricter uh, testing before they'd be allowed to be produced. 
that workplace exposure limits be reviewed and that ingredients in the form of manufactured nanoparticles undergo a full and independent safety assessment by scientific advisory bodies before their use in cosmetics. And once again, this echoes um, some of the conclusions from the previous, previous talk. So nothing particularly new or unanticipated in, in those issues. So in summary, we, we thought nanotechnologies offer great opportunities, and as everybody believes. Um, public debate was needed about their development. In general, most nanotechnologies had no new risks. Didn't, it didn't, uh, were not specifically, because, because of their nanotechnology nature, developing new risks, but that research and regulation was required immediately to address uncertainties about the effects of, of nanoparticles. Now, just off the record, as it were, on this last point, there were, I can tell you that we did look very carefully at whether we would ask the government to withdraw from supermarket shelves some of the, uh, some preparations that had nanoparticles in that we didn't feel had been properly researched. And we, we spent a lot of time going into that in enormous detail and having evidence from all sorts of sources and eventually decided that um, that wasn't appropriate, it wasn't necessary, but that when we said immediately, we meant immediately that Uncertainties, sort of uncertainties, as I say once again in the previous talk, about how nanoparticles might uh, get into the body, for example, or what their, uh, the process of metabolism may or may not be, that this needed to be addressed immediately. And of course that's going on anyway, but this was a high-level recommendation to the government. So there's the report um, that eventually came out. It comes with a CD in the back, which, which has all of the evidence as well. So you can draw your own conclusions. And what was the government's response? Well, it was finally published in February this year. So we published our report at the end of July. The government responded in February. And um, like all these responses, there are some positive things and some negative things. So they accepted... Now, accepting, um, accepting a recommendation is, is different to acting upon a recommendation, but they accepted the majority of our recommendations, so they accepted that they need, the government needed to ensure that nanotechnologies are appropriately regulated. They accepted the need to recognise that some chemicals may be a potential risk because they're in nanoparticle form and have special properties. They also realised that this was not a UK issue, but it's a global issue, and so the government needed to work um, in, in the first instance with European bodies to ensure that consumers are properly protected, and that's, that's actually happening. Uh, for industry to improve the transparency of safety tests for products containing free nanoparticles and nanotubes, so for example, in the cosmetics industry, there's a lot of work that's done on um, nanoparticle-based preparations in order to get approval, but the majority of that work is not in the public domain. And so we felt that was unacceptable and that that, that work should actually be published. Um, and the government agreed that they needed to engage in public dialogue to inform both the direction of nanotechnologies research and progress on regulation as might be necessary. Now, every country is different and you probably realise in the UK that we've had a number of science scares with mad cow disease with MMR and I can't say that science scientists and technologists are well trusted by the public they're not and this is the sent this last point here is really expressing the, the the fact that the the government is sensitive to that and I have to say the government of course isn't trusted either but um, Anyway, this reflects that concern and the sensitivity of the British public to innovations in science and technology at the moment. So there are some specific actions. They're going to um, look 
to prevent releases of free nanoparticles and nanotubes to the environment. So that's, uh, that's something that's actually happening. Um, there are a number of departmental committees, advisory committees, that will now have to report back to us about implications of nanotechnologies for regulation. Um, the development of measurement standards is being given a high priority. And this actually echoes, once again, I think what Vicky Colvin from uh, Rice says about the need for having uh, metrology standards in order to, so that people can talk in the same language when they talk about nanoparticles in terms of sp specifying their size, shape and efficacy. Um, the workplace, re workplace regulation is being reviewed in respect of nanoparticle release or exposure. And that an independent group, an independent group will meet in two years and in five years' time to review the developments and make a public um, response to, in, in respect of what the government has actually achieved. There's also going to be a new science and technology horizon scanning centre, which will work with a range of stakeholders identifying potential health, safety and environmental issues arising from all new and emerging technologies, so not nanotechnology, any new technology. And that once again reflect, reflects the fact that a lot of the issues that we came up with were um, not specific to nanotechnology. So this horizon scanning, which I think is chaired by David King, the chief scientist, will be looking actively at new technologies and trying to pick up these potential issues early. Yep, I'm, I've got one overhead, I think. So what's, uh, that all sounded very positive, but... Um, there are some disappointments. No new money for research. That's a, that was a big blow. We, we actually recommended a, a, a very substantial research program into nanoparticle toxicology and <coughs> metrology. Um, there is some hope that there will be a second report published in the autumn of this year. Um, and there is some internal intimation that um, money will be um, diverted from other areas, perhaps, in, or pull, pull, pull together a number of research streams in order to address this point, but no new money, no extra government money. Um, well, this, they've come and said they to have public dialogue, but they won't publish, say, what, exactly what they're going to do until autumn 2005. And they made no commitment other, essentially, than to say they will produce a document in autumn 2005 that will give comprehensive details of how that public dialogue process will take place. They've effectively rejected the suggestion that nanoparticles should be treated as new chemicals in legislation. Um, the cynical reason for that is that before the government response was delivered, a lot of consultation with industry was made. And the feedback from industry was that if this happened, this would significantly affect <coughs> their ability to be competitive in a global market. And so the government eventually were um, persuaded to reject this suggestion. It's not a, a blunt rejection, it's written in very fancy words, but it's, a, it's effectively a rejection of that because of, for those reasons, for commercial reasons. And the other issue about disclosing methodologies and data relating to safety testing, which companies would, would consider to be um, commercially sensitive, which we ask to be made public if it's to do with human safety, um, Although they said, yes, this was a good idea, they're not prepared to say how much pressure, whether there might be regulation or not, for the same sort of reason as this point here, that there are um, possible commercial pressures that would make this um, affect UK's ability to, um, to, to deliver commercially in the future. European activities, as I said, has already started as an e... This is my last one. DC Action Plan on Nanotechnology. Um, nanoparticles and tubes are on the agenda of the EC Safety Advisory Committees, and there is this NanoSafe 2 range of projects looking into risks involved in production, handling, and use of nanoparticles. I think I've finished there. Thank you very much for your help. Thank you.
to mention so called impacts on privacy and human enhancement. Well, there are a number of issues there, but one, one simple one or obvious one is that if you, let's say you had a, a medical sensor that was implanted into everybody's skin that monitored your health state, that information would need to be communicated to the outside world in some way. And that might be very good in terms of spotting disease early and making treatment effective, but that very information may, could also be used by, for example, um, insurance companies to determine what your health risk might be. It might be used by a prospective employer to decide that, or to determine whether you were, had a heart attack risk, whether you drank too much alcohol, whether you'd taken drugs. So um, that, that's, that's a simple issue where privacy would be uh, and there was a whole conference, in fact, in, in Zurich um, just before Christmas by Swiss Re, which is the world's second biggest reinsurance company, just on those issues, just on insurance issues and the consequences of knowing, potentially knowing so much about uh, this uh, human health state. Uh, I'm just curious, your original thinking about the test every kind, every size, every shape of nanoparticle separately. Hasn't one opened a Pandora's box where there is essentially no limit? So now I have to check 80 nanometer, 90 nanometer, 150 nanometer, and whether they're cubic or hexagonal. It, it seems to me that. that no. Uh, it, business, it sounds like you would have no, I think the simple answer to that is no. I mean, first of all, if you look at the, the physics or the chemistry, a lot of nanoparticles properties don't particularly change. So that rules them out. And other particles actually only change, one property may change very slightly. And there's no point in making six, five, seven nanometers. You just look at what the property range or the, or the size dependence was. But I don't know that until the no, but you test it. Well, but, then but you don't have to test it. Test you, you don't. Those no, you don't. No, you, you test at the extremes. I mean, if you look at actual particles, to take a magnetic particle, which is a nice simple one, a magnetic particle starts to change its property at, at about 250 nanometers in size. And it, it rapidly becomes a single magnetic domain below that. And so your classification would be, well, if it's, if it's below this particular size, all those particles are single domain, and I treat them as single domain. If they're bigger than that, they're macroscopic particles, and there's a bit in between where there's a little bit of uncertainty, because some particles might fall down and become single domain, and some might be multi-domain, so there's a little bit of a grey area in the middle. But it's not as bad as it sounds. It, you know, if you look at the ETC group, who say, you know, you could turn chalk into copper because physics on the nanometer scale is different to the bigger scale, that's, that's extreme. That's an extreme view. It's not anything like that. In fact, if you take that example, um, lots of these properties only exist because the particles are isolated from each other. And you put them together and then you lose it straight away. So when you said about agglomeration, agglomeration of particles is different to independent. So your, it's a question we looked at in detail. It's a good question, but I think it's when you come to actually looking at what physical properties change and how much they change, um, with the right classification, which I think is, is important, it's not a matter of worrying about small incremental changes in size and shape. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. from you. Thank 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 you.
minute uh, while we are organizing ourselves to mention that uh, uh, I heard when we have some discussion in the corridor that there is a common thing to all of us, there is short of a budget uh, for, uh, for research, whether it's uh, here in Israel, in the UK or in uh, the US. I would like to remind you that uh, with my other hand, the Fulbright program, which the purpose is to support cooperation between uh, the people from the US and the people from, uh, from Israel, and my suggestion is that uh, all people concerned or that have an interest to take a, a very uh, a creative uh, approach uh, for that and try to find colleagues either from here in the U.S. or from U.S. in, in Israel. And now, uh, since we are short of time, we'll grab uh, 10 minutes from the, from the break. And uh, my suggestion is that uh, each of the... Um, a respondent will have uh, five minutes to respond, and if we have time, we'll answer some questions from the audience. We'll start from the far end, from your own. Um, okay, I, five minutes really very short. I planned on 20, but let's say, uh, so let me try to restrict myself to maybe three, maybe two or three comments in uh, in the, in the same number of minutes. Uh, even though I'm a physicist, uh, I'm uh, here from Tel Aviv University, but my, but my real, uh, the real field I'm interested in is languages. And let me give you uh, two comments about language. I think uh, <clears throat> out of the discussions of uh, yesterday and uh, today's presentations also, uh, we have two problems that are connected with language. One of them is um, that the scientific community in general, especially in nanotechnology, I would say, has uh, failed to find a, a good spokesman who would uh, transmit in a, in a reliable and uh, trusted way to the public the whole idea of nanotechnology in particular and uh, actually science in general. And um, this is a, a very, uh, I think, serious point. And through uh, this inability to communicate with the public, uh, we are uh, losing uh, a lot of ground and actually increasing the risks to, uh, to science in general and the benefit of, of mankind because we're unable to transmit the importance of uh, doing science and especially nano science and nanotechnology uh, to the public. The second issue connected with language is really to, it has, has to do with um, the language we speak as people of different uh, discipl disciplines. And nanoscience and nanotechnology is really a very good example of a field which is really pluridisciplinary. And um, no way uh, good science can be done, I think, in, uh, in the nano field without people talking across disciplines. And we have to realize that this has to be done since every discipline, every discipline over the years has developed a different language. And as we sit together and try to learn each other's language, no real progress can be made. So these two points, I think, uh, should uh, be emphasized. Um, another thing uh, that uh, was also mentioned by the last speaker, Professor Whalen, is uh, the point of uh, money or new money, but old money is just as good, for research. And uh, of course, we have uh, been informed by uh, Professor Tene and other speakers about uh, the availability of funds for research, but I think uh, in any case, uh, especially for this new emerging field of uh, uh, NST, is far below uh, what is needed. Uh, and this goes especially for a long-term innovative, pluridisciplinary or interdisciplinary research. Um, 
and the support for this kind of research is extremely important. And as we, uh, as we have seen from uh, that uh, particular uh, a graph uh, drawn by uh, Professor King of the UK, uh, I think uh, most, uh, most people, especially scientists, are uh, quite convinced that uh, the uh, uh, strength and wealth and the development of a country is directly linked to uh, its investment in science and technology. The only problem is to uh, convince the people who uh, were responsible for that money. And uh, do you have another 30 seconds? Or Try, but so somebody have to pay for that. Okay. Uh, the last thing I, uh, I want to mention is that uh, I didn't particularly care for uh, putting GMOs and nano in the same boat. I think they are quite different fields. And um, there are major differences between them. Uh, I think uh, unlike uh, GMOs, uh, most of nanoscience and technology has uh, nothing to do with interfering with nature, it's actually interfering with science and technology in a good, in a good sense, I mean. And uh, since it's an infant field, uh, most of the risks either don't exist or are simply unknown. And in order for us to know them, to recognize them, we first of all need to do a lot more research, a lot more standardization, a lot more information about, uh, about um, nanoparticles or nano anything. And uh, also to somehow uh, reduce the hype that's around uh, these particular uh, fields so that people are, uh, are less afraid and uh, especially avoid the risk or the People talk about a lot of risk assessments and hazards. I think one of the risks is that we lose the opportunities that are going to open for us by studying and by uh, research of nano uh, in the nano field. And uh, this we have to avoid. So we have to make sure that uh, the response to the risks or at least potential risks is not to close down research on nano but just the other way around. Thank you. Thank you. Something? Um, okay, I, um, I think I'll take advantage on a few remarks made by you, I mean, it will save maybe a minute or two. I, ah, okay, I'm uh, Mira Marcus Kalish. I'm from the Tel Aviv University. I'm at the Interdisciplinary Center. Uh, for forecasting, technology forecasting, ICTAF, and at the Nano Center. And um, I need to say that Tel Aviv University is um, a core member now at the Nano to Life Network of Excellence that is mainly dealing of, uh, uh, on many of the subjects talked to you today, but um, we have only three minutes, so we'll do it fast. Um, I want to take on what Yoram said regarding the language barriers, and um, I may move there just to show you a few pictures. Um, so um, the language barriers that we were speaking about is, uh, I, I want to title it as uh, knowledge management or uh, knowledge barriers. Because I think if those people would have sit together in the research level, in the industry, really sit together, not just one will follow the other or help the other. Like was mentioned here um, regarding the education, regarding Cambridge Interdisciplinary Center, as well as the Weizmann Institute. So if those things were really operated together, people would sit together in the research level and the, in the manufacturing level, I think most of those barriers would have saved. And now we have today a very big uh, wave. Oh. <coughs> Do I move that? Okay. Um, we, uh, 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 okay. There is a big um, phrase, I would, say, I would say buzzword today, which is converging technology, and it includes what was asked here to enhance human performance. 
And uh, it was initially, as everybody knows, um, built by the NSF, and a lot of money was put in that. Um, Bush signed the billion dollar PEL, and it's very nice, the money, not only because it will encourage this interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary research, but it may force the people to sit together and to um, really change, I would say it's a culture change, because they want to relate to the whole body and the environment as one issue to be dealt in research, and it's not words. It's really that what we want to uh, do to relate to the whole unity as one, and then if we develop drugs that should be treated in one area rather than the other should take into consideration in the clinical trials the environment issues. And um, what I, uh, I mean, there is a new, um, another big wave with a lot of money regarding the cancer and nano-cancer institute and research. I, wa I don't want to go into that. I just want to speak about this sitting together physically in the research uh, while trying to uh, develop something new, including those societal people, including the ethics, including cognitive science, including psych psychiatry and psychology and all those parts. And um, this big wave after the United States making it a national, inst inst uh, na national initiative and then going to Japan and Canada and Europe just published a new, uh, published a new report, another report that you can read and take home. But they say that uh, converging technology in the United States is just for military <laughs> excuse. So Europe came up with a widening uh, converging technology and includes all those phrases. What it really means is those areas that they are really indicated. But I think, um, as I mentioned, the Nano to Life, we have those groups dealing already with the ethic issue and so on. We still don't sit together enough. We, sh we still don't share the real tools, the real, uh, you know, intuition, experience and so on. And what I want, want to suggest, just as a summary, that Israel, uh, following Reshef, uh, Reshef's lecture and what was said about Israel ability, that Israel should take and make it an, uh, a really Israeli or national initiative to bring together all those ability. We are small enough, and that, that's an advantage. We can speak to, it, to each other. We are innovative. Uh, we can bring up this area of converging uh, research or converging technology to a different spot in Israel. Thank you. My name is Rafi Kornstein from the Faculty of Medicine Tel Aviv. I am a biophysicist and I would like to address really the scientific challenge in view of what was uh, presented here because I would say part of the different reports, both in the UK and elsewhere, pointed out really that uh, we don't have enough basic uh, knowledge, at least about the health hazards uh, when uh, exposing uh, population or humans to nanoparticles. Now, nano science and nanomaterial do not really pose uh, new materials in the real sense and we can take really uh, look uh, after what was done in similar areas not uh, identical for example exposure to air pollution and aerosols uh, as was pointed out by professor gray are not exactly uniform and have some contaminating material, but at least the general approach is there and we can uh, learn from there. But going really from, from that point, where the, the real challenge is in science right now, and I think part of it was uh, presented by Professor uh, Rafalovich's uh, presentation about the interaction of gold, gold uh, citrate, nano, particles and titanium oxide with cells. 
the lessons that we don't understand yet there are exact the mechanisms of interaction uh, between nanoparticles and uh, and cells in um, general and I would like to uh, at least express my uh, point of view regarding the hierarchy of importance because size was uh, I would say over stress chemistry is I would say the first principal important characteristic in the interaction of nanoparticle with uh, with cells because the first interaction is really the attraction or repulsion between a nanoparticle and uh, uh, a cell hydrophobic interaction and other types of interaction then in combination comes the size and I would say that the least or I would say of less importance would be uh, the shape so it's a personal view about the hierarchy but uh, uh, to sum it up I would say that uh, we have to understand better the interaction of nanoparticles with the cells not just in the context that was shown in the presentation of uh, Professor Afarovich in the test tube because some particles interact from the air through inhalation directly with the, with, with the lungs so it's really direct interaction of a particle with the mucus that uh, covers the alveolar cells that uh, function really is the the barrier between the, the air and the lung that's a direct interaction of free particles and the uh, laws of game there are different than what we experience when we add nanoparticles in a solution in water they may not be uh, water soluble they will aggregate they can undergo uh, different changes so um, to sum it up I would say that there is really a need for understanding the uh, basic uh, rules in terms of basic uh, science of interaction of nanoparticle with the living tissue thank you thank you um, uh, my name is Yaakov Garb. I'm with the Florsheim Institute for Policy Studies and Hebrew University and I work in environmental studies and the sociology of science and technology. Um, I've been asked to, since I'm the last one, you said somebody has to pay, I think that's perhaps me. Um, so I have four points that I'll um, probably reduce to two. One is a thought that uh, whenever I'm in forums like this recently where talk of the precautionary principle comes up, I um, had a set of thoughts that maybe people here who know more about the field can uh, enlighten me on. But what, it's a thought, thoughts about how to give the precautionary principle teeth. Um, that is to say to you, you being the funder of nanotechnology research, uh, you are sure nothing can go wrong. Therefore, you should have no problem um, bonding a um, very large sum of money in case there, to cover any catastrophe uh, that could be caused by your product or process. Um, now, if you're worried that you'll be completely wiped out if you ever have to pay, surely the chances are very <coughs> small. You yourself say the chances are very, very small. Um, and if you're still worried, then that's what Lloyd's is for. That's what insurance is for. Um, now, it costs hundreds of thousands of uh, dollars annually to get such insurance. You, you sort that out with Lloyd's. That is, why should the public absorb the risk rather than you, the proposer, uh, absorb the risk? Uh, economists talk about the need to internalize, environmental economists talk about the needs to internalize costs. I've been thinking about the need to internalize risks, and I'm wondering if any of you have heard of uh, such approaches because it's something I'm interested in thinking more about as point number one. Point number two, um, there's been talk about the basic dilemma of, on the one hand, uh, the risks and the unforeseen risks, and the other hand, the foregone benefits, the opportunity costs, the um, kids who are even at, over the course of our lecture will die because they're not getting or going blind because they lack of vitamin A. 
in weighing up these costs and risks, we need to disaggregate, start breaking it apart a bit. Whose benefits, whose costs? Um, the risks are very diffuse, one in a million, one in a billion, um, among a lot of people. We as one particular person amongst those. On the other hand, the benefits are very concentrated in the shareholders, in the CEOs, in the scientists, um, and the tr our track record on making sure that the benefits of new technologies are widely distributed are not that good. If you look at 60% uh, of internet connections in the world are in North America. Uh, the chance that you'll have internet connection are seven times greater if you're in the upper income category. The portion of people in the world who can uh, afford uh, even conceivably AIDS drugs well under 10% and so on. Green Revolution, uh, verdict is still out. Um, and when we hear the list of uh, technologies that are already here, I think it's instructive. So Professor Raifalovich talked about improved tires, improved paint on cars, improved plexiglass, improved polymers. Um, you spoke of uh, data structure, sunscreens. Now, um, these are important things, but perhaps not the top priority of most of humankind. Uh, I'm sure the other things you mentioned uh, will come about, the targeted drug delivery and so on, but, and, and yes, we do need the profit motive to harness capital that will create innovation, um, but we need to be better at making sure that a leveling of who benefits and who gets hurt and um, to, make that those, to make sure that those two are, di are not uh, disconnected. That's why I'm, I'm interested in seeing that website you mentioned right in your last slide for a, a millisecond, um, the nano, nano and the poor. Um, participation is one way to achieve that kind of leveling and not participation in the sense of giving information or even in the sense of um, um, uh, public consultations or not even in the sense of involvement and collaboration, uh, but more in a, a more empowered sense of participation where people really control um, the spigot, um, the funding, intellectual property rights, role of government, and so on. The complaint is always, well, you'll have it swayed by populistic uh, populistic sentiments and, and so on, and we need experts to establish the scientific truth. Uh, but this is not only about the scientific truth, but the balancing of conflicting needs and goals. Um, and so you need people with a range of needs, values, goals to be present. I have other points about the Israeli context and some interesting things specifically here about the patchiness of migration of policy versus regulation, but I'll keep that for if anybody wants to speak afterwards. I think that it is clear that there are risk and opportunity, like in every, in every field. I think we touched it very briefly. The time was short, and clearly we can have a continuous discussion. I encourage everyone to continue the discussions that we missed here uh, during the coffee break. And I would like to, say, to uh, thank all the participants. Thank you very much.